Well, Marty, it's great to see you again. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Great to see you. Well, I was just looking back in my podcast history, and you were the 13th guest on my podcast going back to March of 2015. So, <laughs> uh, so here we are at the end of 2020. It's been almost six years since I had you on the show, uh, 200 shows ago. And I would say a few things have changed since 2015. What do you think? Yeah, lots has lots has definitely changed, and and I don't know if it's uh, my age or what, but it sure doesn't feel like that long ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it. In, in some ways, it seems like it's just flown by, and but yeah, 2015 to 2020, and here we are still in a pandemic, and it's it's a different world for sure. And yeah, um, yeah so I appreciate you coming back on the show, and one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you again is. You guys recently made an announcement that you are now offering Bitcoin as a separately managed account. So I want to go into that, but I want to go back a little bit further. I want to really try and set the stage here. And so as, you, as we take a look at what's happening in our world today, at least in the financial world, we've got multi-trillion dollar deficits. We've got the, the rise of modern monetary theory as a way to explain how the government accounting system works. We've got low to negative interest rates with trillions of dollars around the world at that level. We've got still have high unemployment. Uh, we've got the stock market hitting record highs. It's just like all these different cross currents are happening. So I'd love to hear how you think about all of these cross currents that are happening in the financial world, in the investment world. How do you think about all those today? Are we witnessing, I'm gonna say like the birth of a new money regime or how do you view all this yeah well that that was a lot that's a lot to unpack <laughs> and, um you know I, i'm i'm happy to give it an attempt you know i i i in in the firm's perspective is you know we really don't think that we're in a quote new money regime in in, in terms of the potential a, adoption of um mmt i mean the the idea that you know you can have infinite growth of debt um you know it, it only works if inflation is contained and it, you know if if that isn't the outcome i mean it can be in, in an extremely negative environment um then you know i also think about the perspective of you know a new administration under biden um and you know as well as the the, what I think and read about is the high likelihood that, you know, we're going to have a split government, split leadership. Um, I think the likelihood of MMT is still low. Um, and the, you know, this, the overall perspective of, you know, the spending through deficits and then ultimately, you know, um, printing money to, you know, to, to buy the bonds. I mean, I just, I just think that that is, um, you know, hopefully, something that 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 we get our our hands around. It's it's. A, I will pause, but it's also interesting that that you know when you think about deficits and you know all the times that we um, in, in history that we've uh, had times of of reducing it, it's been a one year thing, and immediately following that, um, we're kind of back to business as normal. Um, so I mean the 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 discipline that it takes from a political level, um, I mean, is the risk that I could be wrong that we, it could happen, um, because as you know, we all know that discipline from a political perspective isn't always there. Yeah, and you know, we always think of the Republicans as being more the deficit hawks, yet we've seen whether it's a Republicans in office or it's Democrats in office. The deficits just go up and up and up. And, you know, this idea of the modern monetary theory, I'm actually going to be doing a podcast with Stephanie Kelton, who, who published a book called The Deficit Myth. And she's obviously one of the most uh, vocal and articulate proponents of viewing the government accounting system that way. And so it will be interesting to see how that's going to work. And so far, you know, we, we haven't had too many issues, at least in terms of we're not seeing high interest rates. We're not seeing out of control inflation. But yeah, I think the, the problem is if that becomes the accepted 
way that the government works, then there's really no break on any politician to just spend money to make the the voters happy and continue to stay in power. So I, I think that, and of course, you know, they say it's inflation, but you know, if once inflation starts happening, it might be really hard to to put it back into the bottle. So yeah, so that's a whole nother issue for sure, but definitely something that we'll be watching over the years. Um, so so let's talk about Bitcoin and. I'm interested in hearing how you personally first became aware of it. What were your initial impressions of it? And how has your thinking about what Bitcoin means, what it represents, how has that evolved over time? Yeah, I think um, my, my initial um, kind of experience with it is probably three-ish years old now. Um, and, you know, I've been, been investing in it um, f over that time frame personally. And, you know, the, the, the way I thought about it then, and, and frankly, the way I think about it now, um, is still as a speculative investment. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's not a perfect correlation, but thinking about it like you would venture capital or something like that, where, you know, it's very volatile, um, and you know there there's differences in you know the obviously the the management of those things, but the the, the risk perspective to me is still the same. Um, and I think you know really what's kind of led us um, down the path of, of of providing the opportunity for our clients is that. A, a significant number of clients, um, you know, we have 325 advisors today, and I would tell you all of them, every single one of them have had at least two or three clients ask them about it. And, you know, a lot of our clients are doing it themselves, whether through Coinbase or something similar to that. And, and that idea spooks me. When you hit buy on Coinbase, you have over 30 different cryptocurrencies to choose from. And I mean, how does, you know, our average client, um, you know, go about managing that? And so really what we wanted to do was, you know, as we've talked you know, in the past and, you know, things that, that get, get published about us, um, we like to be innovative and we like to bring, you know, tools and opportunities to our advisors and to our clients um, frequently. And, you know, regardless of where we are in the cycle of this, um, it's something that clients want. Uh, and, you know, as I just heard myself say that, it's, it's still a really small percentage. Um, and it's a small percentage that I think um, that, you know, that it applies to as well. I mean, this isn't something that we're going to be allocating to portfolios across the organization. It's just something that we're going to utilize um, for, for our clients that want it um, so they don't go figure out a way to do it by themselves. Now, you mentioned that you try and like to be innovative here. And I was looking back at the conversation that we had in 2015. And one of the things that you said was, you said, we believe very strongly that investments are a commodity. So I'm curious if you view Bitcoin as just part of the investment landscape, albeit the speculative landscape, or do you view it as perhaps a way for you to differentiate yourself from some of the other advisory firms out there who are staying away from Bitcoin at this point? Do, do you view it as, hey, how do you view that? Well, I, I definitely think bringing um, innovative you know, investment ideas is something that we have always done. So the, the investments are a commodity thing it, to me is, you know, wealth management is at the core of what we do. And investments are a component of wealth management. They're a component, an important one, but they're just a component. And, you know, when, when I think about, you know, looking at, you know, an asset alloc allocation for, you know, our organization and down to the client level, one of the things I think about is there's a large piece of that that, you know, is uh, large cap growth, large cap value that, you know, um, it is hard to truly differentiate yourself. And, and to me, that, that's what the commodity conversation is. But, you know, thinking of, you know, the rest of the allocation 
conversation, you know, we like to find specialty themed oppor opportunistic, um, you know, investment products to bring to our clients. And I mean, you remember back in the day when we owned an asset management firm called Montage and had, you know, eight specialty themed opportunistic investment manager products in, in that organization. Um, I mean, we're, we will continue to do that. Um, one, out of differentiation, but two, just because I like it so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not that you need my um, acknowledgement of that, but I think it's, I, I think that's one way for financial advisors to really add some value is just exactly what you're saying is it's like, Hey, we want to be looking around the corner. We want to see what are some of the innovative things happening out there. And Bitcoin, I think, is a perfect example. It's, it's been out in the wild now for 11, 12 years. It's proven that it can get knocked down, but it keeps coming back. You know, we're at all-time highs again here as we're having the conversation here today. And yes, it is speculative, but there is a lot of demand out there. And so I, I also want to hear how, so you personally got interested in it, and then how did you actually go about figuring out as a firm how can we offer this? Because I think one of the problems that advisors are seeing right now is there's not a lot of great ways for a financial advisor to manage Bitcoin or to get their clients into Bitcoin in a way that the advisor can still monitor what's going on and can help facilitate it. So how did you solve that problem? Yeah, I think that's you know why the, the, the separate account platform is so appealing to us. But you know the, the answer to your question is really it was a wait and see approach that we took. Um, and, you know, feeling confident that some point in time, you know, somebody would solve um, the, you know, the path to be able to do that. And, you know, there, there are a lot of in interesting, you know, products coming to the market. Um, you know, the, there's a, a large um, household name institution that we both know extremely well. Um, that that is bringing something to market probably in the next three to six months, um, you know. And I think there'll be a, a, an ETF probably in two to three years, maybe. Um, so I think that the the attention to it is definitely there. But you know, the we by taking that look and see approach, look and see approach, um, you know, as you can imagine, we have a lot of people reaching out to us. And, and having, you know, w wanting to pitch their ideas, if you will. And what I really liked about this was, you know, the fact that it's custodied, custodied at a known institution, Capgemini, um, and there is, you know, opportunities to do tax loss harvesting inside it. Um, but most importantly, our clients and, and our advisors, you know, get to see what's in the account. Um, and in the, that approach, um, especially with something that's specialty themed and opportunistic, we like. And, you know, at, out of the gates, it's Bitcoin, but it'll expand beyond that. So a couple of things. One is you say it'll expand beyond that. Do you think you're going to invest in other crypto assets besides Bitcoin at some point? Um, over time. Over time, and, okay. And the, the, the thought process, I mean... Um, the, the firm that, that's managing this for us, um, you know, had plans to come out of the gate with more than one, um, but the demand's not there for it. So they're mm -hmm. coming out of the gate with just Bitcoin. As that demand increases, um, I think they will add more cryptocurrencies to it. Okay. So tell me from an operational standpoint, let's say that you're custodying at Fidelity, which is where most of your traditional assets are. And then you've got Gemini, which is holding the Bitcoin and you've got this separately managed account. So from, from an internal Mariner standpoint, what do you log into to see all of this in the client portfolio? And then what does the client log into in order to see, oh, I've got my Bitcoin, I've got my ETFs here, I've got my other individual securities. What, what are they logging into to see all of this in one seamless uh, whole? Sure. So for, for both our advisors and our clients are, um, portfolio management system is Orion. Um, so we will be able to feed, um, you know, 
both examples that you just gave and also, you know, more than that, you know, their, their employers 401k plan and different things like that. So we can, we can give a consolidated picture of that. And then our clients log into our client portal to see those reports. Okay. So is Orion the, the pot then where all of this stuff is going into and then are they logging into if, the, if I'm the client, am I logging into, you say your portal, is that your, your entree into Orion or? Yeah, so think of it this way. Um, the, the, the portal is, is how, they, how they log in to see what it is they want to see. Um, Orion is, is, I mean, it's, it's a report. It's a report that, that we post to the portal, um, as well as maybe tax returns, um, estate planning documents, other important documents for the client. So it, it, it's the, the, the portal itself is separate from Orion. Okay. And then this portal, is this something that you guys designed in-house that sits out on the cloud? No, it's, it does sit out on the cloud, but no, we, we rent it. Okay. Um, and I, I don't think it matters if I say it, but um, it's e-money. Oh, okay. oh, sure. Okay, great. All right. Now, from a compliance standpoint, how did you have to think about Bitcoin? Did you have to change your form ADV or any hoops that you had to jump through from a compliance standpoint to be able to offer Bitcoin? Um, yes, we had to change our, our ADV um, to reflect that, that this is an offering. I think, you know, the, the best way to think about it is, you know, as we were thinking about this um, in, in you know, the, the newness of it, um, my belief that it's still speculative, um, but, but important, um, that we take a conservative approach to it. Um, that, you know, we find an offering that we feel like that we can control from a allocation perspective, um, from a, you know, what, what advisors it gets offered to, what clients it therefore gets offered to, so that we can make sure that you know we're we're living up to the risk profile of each individual, um, and I you know that that really has to drive this from the start. I think that's a really good point there. If you think about Bitcoin for people that just think it's the greatest thing ever invented and it's going to solve all the world's problems, I mean these people are like. It's almost as if they're part of a cult. And, you know, there's the, the saying that, you know, at some point you go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And, and I think I've done that, <laughs> but I'm not, I don't think I'm part of the cult, but I definitely <laughs> find just how the whole thing developed and just all the different pieces that it touches and how you have to think about it. I think to me, it's just fascinating beyond belief. But I'm curious, you said you have 325 financial advisors. Do they have to go through some type of training? And I think you may have said that maybe not all of our advisors will be able to, to offer this to their clients. So how do you think of it from a firm standpoint to train your advisors on this? How do you determine which advisors are going to be able to offer this? What's that look like? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, and I'm glad you, you asked it. So um, the, the, the firm we're using, it's, the name of the firm is Eagle Brook. And, you know, they are rolling out in stages to our advisors. So this initial stage that we're doing right now is a 10 advisor stage. Um, and it starts with training and education. Um, and, you know, the, the, the advisor goes through that process and um, it, it, it is monitored, I guess is the word I wanted, is monitored um, by a senior individual inside our in, um, investment committee, our investment team, um, as well as somebody inside our compliance department that ultimately gets to sign off on every single client that, um, that, that gets, you know, brought up for an account. Um, so we, um, as I said, we're taking a very conservative approach with it. So this isn't something that we're likely, you know, to have, you know, 50% utilization. Um, I mean, we probably won't have 10. So, so we're not going to expect a Michael, Michael Saylor moment here where you're going to put 425 or $450 million into it right away? <laughs> no, you, we are not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you'll have probably 10 
advisors that will start. And is this going to be like a bottoms up thing? So I'm one of those 10 advisors and I've got a handful of my clients who either A, have expressed an interest to me in it, or B, I think it's something that I want to introduce to them. So does the advisor have to get pre-approval to, to even talk about it or to even offer that, hey, we, we now have this as an opportunity for you to invest in? Or, or do they have like, once they're part of this 10 and they've been approved, they have full discretion to put an allocation in there? Yeah, I think the way to think about it is to, to be able to have the offering for their group of clients, they have to go through the training and education piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, in, in all honesty, I mean, our advisors as well as advisors everywhere um, are talking about it with clients because they're being asked. Um, and so it was really important to us that the training and education piece be the center of it. So regardless of if that advisor uses the SMA or not, um, the training and education piece is going to lift their knowledge and therefore the, the client experience overall, whether the client uses it or not. Um, and then I think you asked this in there, um, each advisor will be approved um, and for some period of time, each client will be. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a great way to start. And what I've been telling advisors is I said, look, even if you think this is a hoax, <laughs> for lack of a better word, I still think you need to do your research. You need to do your due diligence. You need to understand it because exactly like you're saying there, clients are going to be asking you about it. And if you just immediately dismiss it out of hand, then you're not going to be looked upon very favorably from clients. And so I think you got to just understand, and at least if you're not going to do anything with it, at least have an informed opinion as to why, so that you can speak intelligently about it. And, and that's part of the reason why I want to have people like you on the podcast is I just think that's such an important message that you can't dismiss it out of hand. You got to understand it and then make an informed decision that, hey, this isn't for my clients. Here's why. If I have someone ask me about it, I can talk intelligently about it and I just say, ah, don't worry about it. You know, the, the interesting thing is, you know, we have advisors and I've spoken to advisors at, at other firms and in my study group and at industry events that certain advisors believe that, frankly, this should be in everybody's portfolio. And, you know, the, the, and I'm not, you know, going to agree or disagree with that. Um, the, the, it, we have one individual that's in the group of 10 um, that doesn't believe in it. And he's doing just what you suggested. Um, he's going through the training and education piece so that he does understand it enough um, to be able to, you know, guide um, the, the, properly and be informed what, uh, about it instead of just having this, you know, call it gut opinion that it doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't need to talk to you about it because you, you get all this. But I mean, one of the things I like about it is this potential asymmetric risk here that even if you have just a 1% or 2% allocation to your portfolio, if this is a 10x or a 20x or a 50x thing over the next few years, it can have a material impact on the upside relative to if it were to go to zero, which I don't think it will. It's only a one or two percent impact on your portfolio. So I think even from that standpoint, to your point earlier about it's a speculative investment, but the risk reward I think looks looks pretty attractive. So along those lines, do you have any parameters in terms of the percent allocation that it could be in a client's portfolio? Do you have any you know maximum percentage of their portfolio that you could allocate to this? You know, um, we will. Um, today, we're, we kind of think of it in the 1% to 2% range. You know, you, the, what, the, the way you just, you know, went through what you went through is exactly how we think. I mean, personally, I'm a huge believer in it. And, and you know, there may be individuals like you, like me, that, um, you know, have the risk tolerance and understanding that, that they may want a larger allocation. And, and those are conversations that can be had. Um, but for a just general allocation guideline, um, you know, for the masses, if you will, I mean, I think it's a one to two percent allocation. Well, so anything else as it relates to to Bitcoin, how you think about that, how you're introducing that, anything else that you want to share that you think would be helpful for 
for other advisors listening to, to know about what you're doing with it? Yeah, I think, you know, whether it's Bitcoin or just anything in general, I think just the, 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 the thought process of, of, you know, it, being innovative, um, you know, having, having new different, you know, specialty themed opportunistic things, as I said before, that, that you can discuss with your clients and differentiate yourself with. I mean, you know, the, the whole um, client experience and value proposition piece of it, I mean, the, it, I personally believe whether it's this or something else, it, it, advisors need something to differentiate themselves in this sea of sameness.